I didn't even think about about death. But shooting actually those Russian tanks, you know, going through there, they can shoot me. Anybody who had a camera was shot immediately by a Russian soldier. At that time, I didn't think about that. But I found that I had to photograph it. You were alive and holding a camera at a very important time in history. You had to think, I'm doing something important. It's very easy to make beautiful pictures. But pictures which mean something, with what's in it. But that's a di totally different story. I took a walk through this beautiful world. Felt the cool rain on my shoulder. You know these images. You grew up with them. They're burned into your brain. They're iconic sequences. Framed and lit and seen through the lens in ways that changed filmmaking forever. All made by the same man. So, who made these beautiful things? Where did he come from? It didn't begin in Hollywood. It began here, in the streets of Budapest. What about his life, his past, his upbringing, led him again and again to look through a piece of glass and make images like these. But first, some context. And schnitzel. Did I mention schnitzel? It's beautiful here. They said that, of course, that Budapest is beautiful. But it is, in fact, almost ludicrously beautiful. A riot of gorgeous architectural styles, palaces, grand public spaces, former mansions of various princelings, the remains of a long gone empire still here, still here. If there was such a thing as building porn, it would be this. Just looking out the window as you drive or trolley by, you think, I want that. Who lives there? Who, who lived there? What's it like inside? And where did they go? From high up Gellert Hill, you get a sense of the layout of the city. Divided, split by the Danube River, Buda on one side, Pest on the other. Hungary's capital, literally divided in two. Historically a crossroads of Eastern and Western worlds. Which is which now? Which is Buda and which is Pest? We are in Buda. If you can right. look down, you're always in Buda. Okay. If you look up to something, then you're in Pest. Peter Zilahi is a Budapest-born poet and performance artist. According to the, the myth I was brought up in, if you are in Buddha, you are in Europe, and the other side is Asia. This was the this was the border of the Roman Empire originally. This big river, right here. Yeah. Why didn't they cross? Uh, the other part, other side is flat. It's hard to defend, and there were all these uh, tribes that were like really right. vicious and uh, not as civilized as the Romans believed. But... They've all been here: the Celts, the Romans, Mongols, the Ottoman Turks all had their way or tried. All left their mark to one extent or another. Then 
mid-19th century, the curious, seemingly improbable Austro-Hungarian Empire. And this is when the city came into its own, fueled by untold wealth, accumulated power, and ambition. Architecturally, intellectually, a great city, one of the world's greatest. And that was the time when Budapest was a really progressive um, metropolis, you know, like the first uh, subway in uh, the continent of Europe was in Budapest. Parliament had like a very sophisticated air conditioning system. So people wanted to come here, wanted to live here, wanted to start a career, wanted to build places like this because it was a good investment. The New York Cafe is one of the last remnants of a society where artists and writers were valued citizens, regardless of financial means. When this cafe was built, there were more than 500 cafes in this neighborhood. And this was the, the biggest and nicest cafe in the world at the time, never to be closed. Here, like in most cafes at that time, a few cents or a few bucks could buy you space all day long, sipping your coffee, thinking great thoughts. Nobody would hassle you. It was a petri dish of creativity. No hipster neckbeard barista would make you feel bad about not spending any dough. Waiters were speaking several languages and right. they read literature and they invited the writer occasionally if he didn't have money because they appreciated their literature. Where are we now compared to that? Don't try that now, of course. Today's New York Cafe patrons spend both their time and their money on things like goose liver terrine. Foie gras is everywhere in Hungary, all over every menu, and it's good, real good. Peter's going for the lamb ragu, a soup. If you would look like a writer, they immediately would bring you a paper and ink, would bring up the dictionary, whatever you were looking for. Also, most people didn't have telephones at home. Right. And you could be called here, you right. could get your mail. Why do I want to attract writers? It's like, I need more jazz musicians in my restaurant. No, they're in bed beats. Yeah, it was, a different, no money. it was a different time. It was not simply about the money. So it was about... Identity. Yeah. We, we want to be yeah. the place that attracts the best and the brightest. Yeah. Even if they don't have money. Yeah. Th those days are never returned. No, those days will never return. Uh, lovely, thank you. For the main courses, Peter gets the filet of perch. I'm going for the pork throttle stew, mostly because I like the sound of throttle. That is beautiful. That makes me very happy. If I were to ask most, most Hungarians, when were the good old days? Yeah, you have the answer. Right. It's right this. Here. It's surrounding that. Of course, it's not all foie gras and fine wines. There are other pleasures just as awesome. Maybe, maybe even more awesome. Like this. Plecharda, a smoky, chilly, working-class joint run by Istvan Babel for the last 25 years, and for obvious reasons, beloved by locals. It's been a long time coming, my friend. And here's why. Look at this. A golden brown pancake heaped with chicken livers, covered, nay, drowned with a rich, deeply satisfying sauce of bone marrow. I gotta tell you, this is great. Now, some of you have noticed and complained that I don't really describe food anymore on the show. That's a deliberate strategy on my part, actually. It's really a lot like writing porn after you've used the same adjectives over and over, like, you know, the penthouse letters. Look at it. There's chicken livers, it's bone marrow, it's paprika, it's a delicious pancake. Is it gonna make your life better at all if I describe exactly how while smacking my lips annoyingly? No. It's good. Venison stew, delicious. And then this. This. Good. Holy. Really? Good. Lord. Jesus. This I need a photo of. Put a human hand next to it. That's just truly terrifying. Who eats that? Behold the massiveness. The surfboard size fried to order in a pan to only the highest standards. Schnitzel of justice. Ride that baby all the way home. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Deeply textured pork flavor with hints of three-day-old fryer grease. 
If a big wave came, I could surf this thing back to my hotel. I kid you not, this is a testament to a great culture. Also gout, but who's counting? Actually, I might be able to get through this thing. Do I get a t-shirt if I finish this? Or my picture on the wall? We are, all of us perhaps, called to serve a higher purpose, put here on earth to do God's mysterious will. Daniel Mate is here for this, to spread the gospel of meat, Hungarian meat-related wisdom in all its delicious, delicious variety. Like St. Francis of Assisi, he wanders the earth doing good works, in this case, highlighting the ancient arts of butchery sausage making and the preparation of many of the Lord's creatures, as he himself would no doubt like to see them prepare. When you heard about the Budapest butchers, not much. We have about 70 butchers in Budapest. Seven? Uh, yeah, in which uh, you can find a a small corner with hot meat and, and roasted meats and so on and so on. It's very... Uh... Wherever you are, you can, in five minutes walk, you can find a butcher where you can eat something. And on this particular corner, Belvaroshi Diznatoros, one of Daniel's favorites. So, you're not a butcher. You're not a... No, 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 no. What, is your, what, what do you... I'm an for? economist. <laughs> you're an economist, as I understand it. You go from butcher shop to butcher shop investigating... Yeah, because... Old I, butchers. Why, uh, why do you do that? Because I really like it, and uh, someone in 2011, I saw that I'm not alone with this. So right. we have to, we should make a fan club. Uh, and then I started to write them uh, on Facebook, and nearly 10,000 likes on Facebook, uh -huh. and, and they are active. It's so, it's so unusual that there are so many, because in France, uh, Germany, in the States, the old school butchers who know how to do all of these things, they're disappearing, you know, their kids aren't doing it. It's not easy to be a butcher nowadays in Hungary, uh, but with this catering function... Right, uh, doing to, prepared food. Yeah, they, they try to save themselves. Yes, there are many boutique cuts of meat available, as one would expect from a master butcher. But then there's this, a field of dreams, a landscape of braised and fried and cured delights that seem, under glass, to go on forever. A good Hungarian butcher shop, they should be able to cut meat, cure meat, make sausage, and cook preparations as well. Yeah. Look at that, there it goes. So beautiful. I mean, there's no comparison with a, a, a supermarket. Plus, you could ask them what's yeah. good today. Today, oh look, what great timing. They're making one of my favorites, blood sausage. You have to say it in English because I can't. Paprika. It's paprika. Uh, oregano? Uh, no, ma'am. Thyme? Majorana. Margarine. Margarine. Uh, uh, Allspice. Here comes the rice. OK. Here comes the blood. Okay. And here comes the blood. Beautiful. <laughs> so good. Salt. And the sugar. I don't understand why. It Just makes flavors it. pop. Beautiful. Season and right into the tube. Dick jokes coming. Stand by for dick jokes. All right, so what do we have here? Ooh, that looks good. Some nice pickles. Braised red cabbage. Over there, from the mighty shanks of some mythical creature, perhaps, a Batalosaurus, or a Deliciosaurus, at least, slow-braised until the meat is falling off the bone. And let there be blood, delicious, delicious blood, in tube form, served, still steaming, nay, heaving, engorged, as you will, with goodness, to squirt across your plate as you press against it with the side of your fork. So delicious. So how often do you do this? Two or three times a week. Uh-huh. What distinguishes a good butcher from an OK butcher? Actually, I myself like old butchers. <laughs> They're doing good business here. And it's cheap. Yeah? I can't tell you which, which is my favorite butcher in Budapest because yeah. all, of them, all of them is different. Right. You ever just go out for, like, a salad? No. <laughs> I, I kid, I kid. Mm.
There is another long tradition of artistry here in Budapest. We grew up with their works. Visual artists, photographers, filmmakers. Where did they all go? Well, World War I happened, and with it, the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Budapest and all Europe changed forever. A decades-long wave of emigration began. A stunning number of the world's great photographers fled their native Hungary and took up new lives. Eventually, this man joined them. I mentioning still since I remember I was living, basically. I was five, six years old when I was taking pictures with my father's Kodak camera. The right moment you have to capture, and that's the difficult part. The exact moment which told the story. The Hungarians, there is this thing to, to excel. My father was not really an artist. He was a, a soccer player, a, a very good one. He said, son, whatever you do, you have to be the best in it. First, not second, you have to be first. Because otherwise it's not worth it. Vilmos Zygmunt, legendary cinematographer. If for some reason you don't know the name, you sure as hell know his work. The Oscar-winning Close Encounters. The Deer Hunter. His absolutely revolutionary work on McCabe and Mrs. Miller. The Long Goodbye. Deliverance. He created a whole new palette, took crazy risks, changed film language in ways people still try to imitate. And he's making our camera crew very nervous, I can tell you. You self-taught yourself. You taught yourself to shoot. Basically, I, I always tried to use my father's little for that camera. My luck was actually that I became sick with some kidney disease. I, I was in bed for a month, and then Uncle Mark gave me a book about Eugene Dulovich, who was a great photographer. I bought the camera for myself and started to take just amateur pictures. One thing that hasn't changed through the years is the Hungarian affection for taking the waters, marinating in thermal baths, a tradition going back to the Romans, continued by the Ottomans, and something that survived right through two wars and communism. And they do it in style. Who came here in, in, back in those days? Was this reserved for, did anyone who wanted to could come here? Well, you know, money-wise it was, since nobody really needed us money, so everybody could afford it, basically, because it was cheap. Right. In Hungary, you have so many spas. There are many bathhouse spas. Baroque, elaborately appointed wedding cakes built atop mineral-rich hot springs gurgling from the earth. None more beautiful or storied than the Geller. So you arrived in Budapest around age 21. What, what was the city like then? It was always beautiful in those days. I mean, they could not... I mean, they were ruins after the war, 1945, I think. Half of the city was still in ruins. You know, they didn't do much. They didn't have money, you know. When you first moved here to go to film school, what was your average day like other than your studies? What did you do for fun back then? What were your options? And my options were zero. Imagine that we had the school, we have very, very little help from the government, very little money. It was good enough to have breakfast and lunch or breakfast for dinner. You have to skip one lunch if I wanted to buy a pair of socks. So we were very, very poor. But I must say that under this whole four years, this is probably my happiest part of my life under communism, because I was learning cinematography. So I fell in love immediately. In fact, some of Vilmos's most powerful and world-changing footage occurred around this time, before leaving Hungary, 
as a film student during the outbreak of revolution. But we'll get to that later. In many ways, Vilma Zygmunt's career as one of the great cinematographers in film history begins here, in Zeged, about 200 kilometers south of Budapest. Here he was raised by his father who worked many jobs to make ends meet. Weekends and warmer months all over Hungary, wherever there's a river and fish, places like this are thronged with families. And here, along the Tisza River, is no exception. Here, young Vilmos and his dad would come and eat halasle, the local specialty of fish soup. How old were you when you first came to this place? I must have been about seven years old. You know, my father was, was really great. In those days, years actually, he didn't have much time, but occasionally he wanted to take me away somewhere, you know, on a day away from work, because he loved this place, actually. He loved, it's especially this, this charda, this fish soup. Well, oh, that's murky and good-looking, yeah. yeah. And some bread for this, for sure. Pike from the river simmered low and slow in a rich fish stock with a healthy amount of onions and the near ubiquitous but always delicious paprika. Ooh, that's good, right? Good. As a kid, I loved that. That fish tastes so good. Um, during the summer, they, they open the windows, they meet outside. Work. And then, then they go and swim in the river. It was a great place. It used to be a great place for fun. And you know, at night, we used to come here at night when the gypsy, gypsies were playing music. And I loved that, actually. I always loved gypsy, gypsy music. They were playing Hungarian songs. I had a very happy childhood. It was good times until, until, until the war got in and then stopped all that uh, happiness, you know, there was just hard times. Were you fully aware of how bad how grave things were. Near the end of the war, until the Germans came in, and then, then the Allies started to bomb us. And they, they started to, to take uh, uh, Jews, actually, uh, into working camps. That, that, that started to be very, very ugly. For people of your generation who grew up, I mean, these were <coughs> incredibly insecure times. Psychologically, what do you think that teaches you as far as a world view? Do you, do you become more adaptable? Do you become more suspicious? Do you become more cynical? It's about survival, actually. We want to survive as Hungarians, to preserve our identity as Hungarians. That's what we did and survived. He saw a lot as a young boy, as he would later as an adult. In 1944, German tanks rolled into Hungary. His country was now in the hands of a foreign power, and not for the last time. And you know, me, me thinking back to my school years, I almost say that those were my happiest years in my life. Being under the, a terrible regime, terrible things that happened all around us. We were starving practically, but we were studying cinematography. Being in a film school was like an, like an island in the craziness. I grew up in New Jersey. My family was sentimental about beautiful pictures, a beautiful script. We saw every film you ever shot uh, and, and talked about them at the dinner table. Uh, these were important. This has got to look pretty close to the way it did in the old days, yeah? Oh, yeah. It's, it didn't change much. Through it all, for Vilmos, there was this place, however, a very special place for a boy growing up during wartime, the movie house where he saw his first films. So what memorable films did you see in this theater? My probably best experience that I had in, in, in my life, I was in Hungary. 
see Chaplin's uh, The Dictator. Democracy, stonk. Democracy is fragrant. Liberty, stonk. Liberty is odious. Free sprechen, stonk. Freedom of speech is objectionable. A great experience, you know. Chaplin did such a great job, you know. Some films, of course, resonated more than others. The power of the visual image intensified, maybe, by what was going on just outside that dark room. Films could be inspiring. They could also be dangerous. It was so magic to me. I mean, they still are. To go to a film, especially a dangerous one, one that was just with the subject matter and the, the content was, was different, and to see that, it just, oh, oh my God, I, what, what do I do with my life now? After seeing it. This theater, by the way, is now named in his honor. When you look at footage you took uh, during the, the revolution, you're not in those pictures, but do you see yourself? I mean, do you remember what it felt like? I remember that I was, I was actually uh, fed to death. Shooting actually those Russian tanks, you know, going through there, you know, that can shoot me. But I felt that I had to, for, to photograph it. Tanks were going from one side to the other side of the Danube, and... There were tanks coming across this? Well, yes, actually. It was a pretty cold, cold day, too. Yeah? Not this cold, but it was. It was raining, it was a bad weather, so it was very much, uh, you know, in sync with what was happening in Budapest. After the war, a Cold War. Hungary now found itself firmly in the grip of the Soviet Union. Germans had been replaced by Russian commissars and their obedient Hungarian functionaries. Young Vilmo Zygmunt was now at film school in Budapest, learning his craft, along with his new best friend, who'd also go on to become a legendary cinematographer, Laszlo Kovacs. Then, in 1956, something amazing happened. Hated emblems of red tyranny went down as Hungarian patriots for 10 glorious days sent Russian armored might reeling in a struggle which pitted raw courage and rifles against tanks. A few blocks away where the statue of Stalin used to be, and on the first night, actually, when the revolution started, the people wanted to, to take the statue down. It took about a couple hours, actually, to to cut Mr. Stalin's legs off. And they actually dragged him around the city, you know, the next day, people and, and took pieces home as a souvenir. To date, this was something that had never been done. The Hungarians took to the streets. A revolution. That's when Vilmos and Laszlo and some pals snuck 35 millimeter cameras and film out of their school's equipment room and at great risk to themselves, joined their countrymen in the streets, documenting the revolt and the aftermath. These images are from some of that historic footage. It seemed for 10 glorious days that freedom had finally come. Encouraged by the West and by CIA radio broadcasts in particular, the Hungarians believed that help was on its way, that this was it. They dug in and fought, hoping to hold out until help arrived. On November 4th, a desperate plea went out over the airwaves. This is Hungary calling. This is Hungary calling. For the sake of God and freedom, help Hungary. The Russians had been beaten back for a time, but now they doubled down with a vengeance, pouring tanks and troops and heavy armor back into Budapest and brutally and all too effectively put down the resistance. Help never came. I mean, this, this is a place where a lot of things happened. It used to be the AVO headquarters. I never shot this before, so this is probably the first time I'm going to have this building shot. So this was the internal secret police. So if someone yes. came at night with a van and you were taken away, you ended up being interrogated here. Yes. Secret police headquarters in 1956. 
the site of a firefight between snipers on the roof and their fellow citizens below. Then the people got into the building, went up there, caught them, brought them down and killed them, actually. Basically, and hang them on the streets. Hung them here. Hang them in one of those, those, those streets there. I'm trying to find a tree which they hung those people up there in the room of these trees. Have you seen people killed before? Before the revolution? No. It's a very tragic <laughs> moment. The building is abandoned. The door, as it turns out, wide open. Oh, wow. Oh, look at that. It still feels sad. A little haunted, yeah? yeah. Well, those were vicious times, you know. People's life was not not really important for these people. They were cruel. Picking up people at midnight and taking them somewhere, and some of them went to Siberia. They killed so many people after that time. Unfortunately, like, photographed us, you know. And they went through the film. The people were, were in trouble, and many were killed. Two hundred thousand people left the country at that time. Hungarians. How long did you stick around? Almost three weeks, and that's when we realized that nothing is going to change. You left Hungary with a lot of cans of film. As much as we could carry. We had just enough money, basically, to get to, to America. The soundtrack to Old Budapest, the ubiquitous gypsy violin, found at one time in every cafe or restaurant. It's a hard life, that of a professional musician, as true a statement in Budapest as anywhere. These guys are Budapest Bar, an eclectic troupe of extraordinary musicians united by their dedication to that uniquely Hungarian crossroads of gypsy and classical music. What does a band do when the hour is late and sustenance and perhaps some strong drink is required? It's back to the flat of lead violinist Robbie and his manager wife, Andrea. And of course, they must play more music. Do you have to be a gypsy to play the gypsy music? Yeah, oh, no, no hesitation. Do you repair this to come back? He says it's very rare that anybody who is not a gypsy can play gypsy music. In gypsy music, the whole lifestyle, the whole spirit is in. And kids start learning it when they are two or three. By the time you are eight, you have all these ingredients in your blood. Margit Bongo, basically the Aretha Franklin of Hungarian gypsy music, a household name, also a fantastic cook. 
Extraordinary singing talent does not preclude her from overseeing a classic lineup of dishes like chicken paprikash, whole perch roasted in bacon, stuffed cabbage filled with goose meat, and slow cooked. And of course, the inevitable goulash, the iconic dish you see everywhere, but rarely as good as this. Should I put a little sour cream on there? Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. Bon appetit. Thank you. She says it's her own special recipe. Luxurious. <laughs> if you're a musician and living in Budapest right now, this is a good time to be a, a, a musician. No, no. Not your rose. It's yeah. not. It's not a good time. <laughs> not your rose. Depends on the view. So <laughs> has életben ilyen mint Magyarországon a muzikus társadalom az teljesen halott. It's very bad for the gypsy musicians, generally mondom, speaking, because it's dead. It's completely apart from things like Budapest Bar, gypsy music is extinct. It's, it's heartbreak is sadness of a, an important part of this music. I mean, Hungary is a country that has experienced a lot of heartbreak. So uh, it is a lot of heartbreaks, it's a lot of difficulties. And, uh, and there is another saying that uh, the violin is crying, the, the gypsy violin is crying, or uh, there is another one that uh, even if we have joy, we cry, the Hungarian. Tonight, Vilmos has invited me to the home of his longtime friend and colleague in the film business, Richie Romwalter. Vilmos met Rishi on the set of a movie more than 20 years ago, and they've been friends and partners ever since. Your health, that's what it is. Thank you, cheers. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> In Hungary, it would be Egeshegadra. I'll never learn to pronounce that. Egeshegadra. Egeshegadra. Richie's wife, Maria, daughter, Judith, Vilmos's wife, Susan, friends and family reunite for the best of simple pleasures. We start with a rich caraway and onion and paprika soup, finished with homemade croutons. There's marha perkolt, a deeply rich, deeply warming beef stew with some smoked pork sausage mixed in for good measure. Cooked slowly for hours, and of course, heavy on the paprika. Traditional cucumber salad. To accompany the stew, nokedli, boiled dumplings. Our style in photography 
was not realism. It, we called it poetic realism. That's what we, we always thought about with cinematography. We are emphasizing basically the, the beauty of the things, but, but also I make it more beautiful than it is. Why is Hungary so strong on photography? I think they were very strong in mathematics, which was in the early days connected to <laughs> photography. Bill Bush tells me about his education in math. It was totally different than what mm -hmm. I received. Very good at school. That's what I said, that schools in Hungary were very, very good. This is no kind of an answer to me. Well, You've made yeah. some of the most iconically <laughs> beautiful <laughs> images that you know we've known in the modern world. And you keep telling me, well, I was smart in school, or I was good at math, or it was don't a good- tell me, what would you like to hear? I was the, the, touched by God. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what I'm- If you were regularly creating the sublime, I'm looking for a metaphysical answer, I don't know. We learn this. We learn to be an artist. So if I would ask you that how was dinner? So <laughs> deeply delicious. Thank you. Oh, oh really oh. good. Really good. Oh. Wow. Oh, thank you. I'm glad. Shame what a great meal. Glad. Thank you. Do we emerge fully formed with a God-given eye? For pictures, images that can move people? Or are we the end result of all the things we've seen, all the things we've done, the places we've been, the places, the people we've had to leave behind, all that's happened in your life? Is it those things that bring the light or the darkness to the blank screen? And what about the faces of those we capture in our magic lenses for a minute or a second or an hour? Afterwards, should we think about them and where they might be now?